Welcome to another edition of Inside Medicine. I'm your host, Doug Geinzer, and we are here in the studio today with our co-chairs of the Las Vegas Hills Legislative Council, Charles Perry and George Ross. For those of you that are new to the show, uh, Inside Medicine is all about bringing leaders of the healthcare industry, physicians, lobbyists like we have here today, and those doing innovative things and improving the quality of health in Southern Nevada. We bring them to the table and we have real conversations and we look forward to hearing from our viewers. You're able to chat in live with us at uh, VegasVideoNetwork.com slash live. Feel free to ask those questions. We will get to those as they pop up. And uh, you could view this broadcast live at any time or on our YouTube channel, Facebook, or on LasVegasHeels.org. Gentlemen, welcome to the studio. Thank you, Thank Doug. you. Thank yeah. You, Doug. So you both are veterans in the legislative process. You've been at this for quite some time. You both bring a different type of background, diversity and experience. Uh, Charles, you're a past legislator in the earlier session. You've been involved in health care since 1970, early 70s? 1975, 1976. Yeah. And, and George, you've got some national experience. You fought for uh, big oil for a while, and you bring that uh, level of expertise that we frankly haven't seen here in Nevada. So it's uh, great to have you both in the studio. So I want to start off by talking a little bit about the quirkiness of the legislative process in Nevada. We're different than most states. George, tell us, you know, from a national perspective, looking at it, what what makes our process unique? Well, first of all, it's a citizen legislature. It's It was a small state. It's still, it has grown incredibly rapidly, uh, but we haven't really changed how we do our government very much. So we have... Uh, uh, people who actually really work for a living, have real jobs for a living, who choose to ser- do public service. They still know all their constituents. They walk their districts. They have, they're have they very, very accessible. They do not have big staffs who deal directly with a legislator. Uh, I think that's critical. I think the fact that because it is small and, and uh, the political group is still relatively focused, you can have an idea, and six months later it can be mm-hmm. law. You know, in a big state like California, it's years, and nationally, it could be decades or sometimes yeah. fast. But it's things can happen, and you get to know the folks, and it's they're real human beings. Charles, is that a good thing? A bad thing? No, I think it's a very good thing. Uh, you, you know, um, in in my time in Nevada, I've come to know just about every member of the legislature. I know them by their first names. They know me. Uh, a lot of times, they didn't know exactly who i was but they knew that i was the nursing home guy yeah the post acute guy <laughs> right so and so tell us a little bit we're, we're every two years every two years and um you know we started out that it was a 60-day session uh, uh I, I understand at one time that um uh, uh, our, our man up in uh, virginia city uh Samuel Clemens, uh-huh. Mark Twain said that the, the a good thing for the legislature would do would be for it to meet every sixty years for two days. <laughs> so we started out; we met every two years for sixty days, and mm-hmm. and the uh, the trick to that was that the legislators got paid for sixty days. Uh-huh. If the session ran longer than sixty days, which it oftentimes did, then they just did not get their their salary any longer, but they did get their per diem. Mm-hmm. Legislatures uh, sessions could uh, legislative sessions could run as long as uh, I, I think in 1983 uh, we started uh, the first Monday in uh, the, the first Monday after the after the second Monday or whatever the days were mm-hmm. in January we uh, we adjourned sine die in uh, on May 23rd. Well. So, uh, so you got done you know, earlier. Yeah. Well, well now, actually, we started we started earlier in those days. Yeah. Now the legislature meets starting after the first of February, mm-hmm. and it goes until June, and it's a it's a uh, specified one hundred and twenty day session. Okay. Uh, we met for as long as it took, and I think uh, the the nineteen eighty three uh, session of the legislature, to my memory. Second longest session that was ever held in the state of Nevada. Wow. Well, legislative session. Yeah. So, George, is that common in other states? Well, most most other states have yearly sessions. Yeah. And some have, uh, it's like California is basically a professional legislature that are paid to be legislators. Uh, so it's a year-round job. Yes, yeah. it is. A lot of states have a uh, a one big, one longer session for 
not for all the issues, and then a second, much shorter session just for budget issues. Yep. Uh, you can understand how that happens. We solve that by having an interim finance committee that makes the smaller financial decisions along the way. Yeah. So I want to dive in and talk a little bit about the Legislative Council. They just met yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, they meet on a monthly basis. Charles, you've been involved with that group, God, 15 years probably, right? Oh, yeah, yeah at least since, basically since it first started. Yeah, yeah. So what does that group do? Well, the Legislative Council Bureau mm -hmm. is the uh, is the lawyers. Yeah, no, I'm talking about Legislative Council for Heels. So you guys okay, share well, that no, group. You're, yeah, you're, yeah. No, you, the, oh, you're talking about our yeah our Heels Legislative uh, Committee. Yes, or, sir. Uh -huh. or, or task yeah, task force. force. Yep. Uh, gosh, well, we've been doing that since about uh, 2002, if if my mm -hmm. memory serves me correctly, um, and and we met fairly informally. Uh, we were all volunteers. We we basically the uh, the the uh, prototype or the beginning uh, of of Heels, which was Southern Nevada Medical Industry Coalition, was a group of all volunteers. Sure. And we we had a lot of members, but we basically didn't have much leadership in the terms in, in like we have now. We didn't have an executive director. We didn't mm -hmm. have we didn't have a Doug Geinger. Let me put it <laughs> that way. Uh, uh, helping to get things organized and 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 put into a a real infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, now we do so, and that took place. I guess you've been on board now with us. What? Uh, well, well, twenty ten. You, well, you've been on board as a as a found one of the founding members of this sure. group since two thousand and two. Uh, but you've been on the job since 2010, so that's that's basically when we started getting some uh, some traction. Okay, so you know, yesterday, George, the group met. Who's who's at the table? What does that look like? Well, you have uh, basically people from almost every aspect of healthcare and mm -hmm. some of the more general economic groups. Mm -hmm. uh, you have hospitals, you have doctors, yep. you have labs, you have uh, more specialized medical providers, uh, you have the flying ambulances, mm -hmm. uh, you have. Um, the you so you, usually somebody there from UMC, uh, somebody from the uh, pharmacies, yeah. uh, the Las Vegas Chamber frequently is involved, and and so basically it's a combination of all aspects of the healthcare industry as well as the general business community. Yeah. So that is that what makes it unique, Charles? You've been around. Is is that what makes us different than just the hospitals or just the doctors? It seems like we're able to get a, a 360 viewpoint. Well, I think that was the whole purpose of of getting together to begin with. And, and it does make us very unique because uh, in most places that you go to, you have all of these different groups that are in their own little silos, yeah. so to speak. And they don't talk to each other. And I think that the one thing that we have accomplished is getting all of these disparate groups of people together, talking to each other, knowing each other, mm -hmm. and uh, sitting down and saying, you know, well, what works, what doesn't work, what we can do, what can we do to make it better? So it's a common mission, and it's really yes. a mission for the, the industry. Yes. Yeah. So what what do you think was like that tipping point? I recall, I'm not a, I'm not a political junkie. I don't really like to get too involved in the legislative process, uh, but it seems like there was a moment uh, a couple years back, and I, I recall Alice Martz from the uh, Chamber of Commerce from Hender, Henderson uh, really talking about what value she got out of it. And Charles, you were actively engaged back then as you are now. What what was that moment? What did she bring to the table that uh, was the uniqueness? Well, I think what Alice brought to the table and, and, and the Henderson Chamber of Commerce, quite frankly, uh, was sort of the vanguard in all of this for us. Uh, they recognized that they represent the business community. Mm -hmm which includes the healthcare community, but they didn't have some of the expertise that we have on the working committees that we have or the task forces that we have in HEALS. So uh, their, uh, their way to deal with all of this was we, we, we know we need to go to the legislature. We know that we need to represent the healthcare uh, people that are members of the chamber but we don't, know what, we don't know the answers. We don't know the issues. So when we get ready to uh, do our uh, legislative uh, agenda for whatever legislative session we're talking about. We're going to use you guys as to to tell us to to be our guide yep. to help us. So that's unique because it's a partnership between healthcare and the business community. Because at the end of the day, business really pays for healthcare. Absolutely, they sure do. Yeah, George, tell us, you know, how, how far in advance do you all start working on your legislative agenda? Is it just an ongoing process, or it's, it's ongoing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, Tell us uh, some of the issues that you talked about yesterday, just at a high level, some of the things that, that, that the group talked about. Well, 
you know, we talked about uh, re- Medicaid, re- Medicaid and insurance reimbursement levels. That's a big one. In our state, they are very low compared to other states, yep. and they're an extraordinarily difficult problem for hospitals and doctors and in the whole healthcare industry. Yep. Because, and especially with Medicaid expansion, uh, you have a tremendous uh, increase in the number of people being served every day. So that's a yep. real problem. We'll talk about that more later. I yeah, know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, graduate medical edu- graduate medical education yep. uh, is another one where. The uh, Las Vegas Hills should put a real feather in its cap because uh, about three years ago, Doug, you put together that uh, your task force, which morphed into the governor's task force, which led to the state appropriating $10 million to help get that going. But the the buzz, the conversation, the focus on it by all the key stakeholders led to uh, we now have a uh, uh, about 55 uh, Residents, new brand new program starting at Mountain View this summer. That's big. Uh, the UHS system, Valley Hospitals, yep. are starting a, a program. Uh, Barbara Atkinson is going to have one at the UN, at UNLV clinics yep. that she's putting in. So they're they're coming, and uh, that's critical. And uh, another one we talked about was uh, which grad. Um, to graduate medical education, medical health, me- mental health rather. Mental health, mental yeah, health that was something and you guys health. took on, I think, the 15 session, right? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get the bill we really needed. It sort of wasn't quite the highest level. It's pretty controversial things going on in the last session, and it yep. almost made it. But I, we have a number of the leaders who are pretty committed to getting that going this session. Yep. What we had done, you may recall that the governor uh, appointed his uh, behavioral health council. Uh, a lot of key leaders in the state, mm-hmm. they uh, put together uh, some key recommendations and the, which were adopted in the short run. Yep. Uh, their long-run recommendation was regionalization of mental health. Yep. And that's the piece that uh, got dropped a little. Yep. And we are very in- encouraged and hopeful that uh, that will be taken up legislatively. Uh, certainly we have a lot of support for it. Yeah, it seems like um, just a couple weeks ago, the Southern Nevada Forum got together. And uh, for those of you that are new to the show, the, the Southern Nevada Forum is a group of legislators, both Republican and Democrat, Assembly and Senate, uh, that get together to talk about the best interest of, imagine this, Southern Nevada, mm-hmm. uh, considering we're 70% of the states. And uh, they brought forward a list of those recommendations, those priorities. And uh, if, just to touch on them at a high level, I know um, regional regionalization mental health was one. I think the top one was reimbursements. We're going to spend a little bit of time on that uh, momentarily. Uh, And I believe expanded graduate medical education was the next one. Tell how does uh, how does your group, Las Vegas Heels and and the Legislative Council, intertwine and work with the Southern Nevada Forum? Are they one and the same? Are they different? Do they collaborate? Uh, How does that look? uh, They're actually separate, but Mm -hmm. the Legislative Forum was put together by uh, Marilyn Kirkpatrick and her role then as majority leader, I think she was and uh, Crescent Hardy, a conservative okay. Republican. But what they realized was that on issues that were non-ideological but were of regional significance, the Northern Nevadas, Nevadans, no matter whether they're Republicans or Democrats, liberal or conservative, worked together for the good of the North. Mm-hmm. And the Southerners were always seemed to be split. Yep. And they realized that the North was, quite frankly, outdoing the South on a lot of issues and a lot of programs. And uh, they needed to have a common voice on those types of issues. Yeah. And so that, that led to the forum, which is a combination of re- Republican and Democratic legislatures and any stakeholder with relevance who wants to be involved. And they work on legislation uh, in a number of different issue areas that are good for Southern Nevada. Yeah. And we had uh, one of those committees is the health care subcommittee. Uh, much of what the short run uh, adopt policies that the governor's council adopted uh, two years ago came out of the, that forum, as well as the proposal for the regionalization, which ended up as a major long-term proposal. Uh, but they have a whole slew of other groups, transportation, uh, economic development, uh, infrastructure, you name it, they've, there's about seven of them. And a lot of good legislation comes out of there. Yeah. So Charles, you've been in the legislature and around the legislature for quite some time. Has yep. this is this common, or is this kind of a, a new way of looking at things? Has Southern Nevada ever come together before, and has healthcare ever come together before? Well, one of the unique things about the uh, about the legislature in the state of Nevada is that we know we used to have like uh, about three population centers in the state of Nevada. We had Southern Nevada, of course, which is Las Vegas and Clark County, and then you had uh, the rest of the state, Northern Nevada, which uh, includes 
Washoe County and, and Reno and Carson City and, and, and Elko and, and those areas. But then we also had the cow counties. And um, at, at one time in the legislature, the, the power was, was not in either southern Nevada or northern Nevada. It was in those cow county representatives, huh. uh, state senators and state assemblymen, that um, basically would, would get together and side with, with whichever one of those groups was giving them the best deal. And it sounds like the North gave them better deals for a long time. Uh, that's exactly right. And, and then you had the phenomenon of a guy like uh, State Senator Bill Raggio, mm-hmm. who was from Reno, a, a district attorney. Quite a and, legend. Uh, quite a legend in his own right. And uh, one of his major uh, missions, if you will, was to look out for the people in the Reno and Carson City and northern Nevada areas. And I think he did a fine job at that. He did a <laughs> magnificent job with that. Uh, that was always, when he went into the legislative session to begin with, his end game always was what he was going to come out with at the end of the session that benefited northern Nevada. Mm-hmm. It took a long time for, for the guys and gals down here in southern Nevada to decide, hey, you know, we, we, we've had the power in the legislature in terms of numbers since 19, the 1983 session. Uh, we have not ever, uh, and I don't think even in the 13 and 15 sessions, I don't believe we've gotten to the point yet where we exercise that power like they have exercised that power for years in northern Nevada. Once we get to the point where we realize how much we really control population-wise and and numbers of representatives in the state legislature, because most of those people that represented the cow counties, they're no longer there yeah. because yep. the cow counties, so, so to speak, have lost uh, population, and that means that they've lost representation in the legislature. So those legislators now are, are distributed more between, like, Elko, Reno, and Las Vegas than they ever were before. Yep. And and Las Vegas or Clark County with 75% of the state's population has, uh, uh, we don't have 75% of the representation in the legislature, but we are the majority. Yeah, so we, we, we so, put more funds into that bucket. That's absolutely correct. Mm-hmm. We put more of our tax dollars into it. Reno and the northern Nevada areas get more of those tax dollars back for, for their purposes sure. than we do down here. It seems to be changing. George, have you seen a shift since you're, you've been in, how long have you been in Nevada? I've been lobbying here since 1989. And oh, I, so you've I, seen the yeah, change then. I've seen, the, I've seen that. And what's really happened, I think, behind all what Charles is talking about is the explosion of population in Southern Nevada yeah. with the tremendous growth of the big casinos uh, in the 80s, the ni- late 80s, the 90s, and the first half of the 2000s. And that led to a tremendous explosive growth. Uh, it's when we talk about we have education issues. It's because we the, they grew so fast. We have to educate all those children. Yeah. Similarly, with healthcare, why are we 49th or 50th or 47th in all these rankings? It's because you know the 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 number of people living here grew a lot faster than our ability to recruit doctors, to recruit nurses, to uh, frankly build hospital rooms and and bring in the specialists. And what the gra- the graduate medical education program, for example, mm-hmm. is designed to do is help bring you can is bring in more doctors. You can have all the lo- medical schools you want, and it's, we have t- my client Tora, which graduates 130 DOs every year. Mm-hmm. We have. Uh, uh, UNLV's medical school starting. We have the one at, for UNR. Uh, so we have the medical schools, but what happens is doctors, 70% of the doctors who do their residency in an area, that's what graduate medical education is, it's that four-year residency, yep. they stay where they do their residency. So the more residencies we create, the more likely we are to keep yes. doctors. If we didn't have yep. those residencies, we would just be educating people to go to Texas and Idaho or yep. Florida to practice medicine. And we need a place for those folks as well as folks from other yep. medical schools in other states who want to yep. come here to come. And similarly, as you do that and as you start allowing the hospitals and, and providing a, an, an a, a economic environment where hospitals feel comfortable that they can afford to invest in new facilities and new programs and you can attract doctors, you start building up your specialties. We have terrific 
programs in a lot of our hospitals and by a lot of our doctors. We have some absolutely fabulous doctors. We just don't have enough of them. You know, it's funny. So it's uh, the mission of Las Vegas Hills, obviously, is to improve the quality of health in Southern Nevada. And we look at our quality challenges, because we do have those, uh, being caused by lack of access, and access is being caused by lack of workforce. Uh, and we've worked very hard at fixing the workforce pipeline. I think we, we've got that pipeline built. Uh, we've got, we'll have got have three med schools in Las Vegas in uh, 2017. Roseman University coming online, uh, in addition to UNLV and Toro, who you represent, already graduating 130. We'll have this expanded residency programs, and by our math, it looks like we'll more than quadruple the number of residency programs, and that may even increase the number of residents as a whole. The next thing seems to be we've got to start focusing on retention, mm-hmm. keeping them here. What's What keeps doctors where they practice? Well, I think you know they 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 learn their they learn their profession where mm-hmm. they where they do their residencies. Yep. And um, one of the things that keeps doctors uh, interested and and excited about being in a, in an area is is being able to get paid for their services. Payment matters. I think payment matters in yeah. most anything that you do, but uh, and, and medicine is no different. Uh, we've been exporting uh, doctors and nurses mm-hmm. from from Nevada for quite some time the, the the doctor situation is a little bit different from the nursing situation in 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 the respect that there's no that you know there has been until we really got to pushing it there has not been enough uh, a GME yep. graduate medical education available to these people so they would just go out of state you know, once they got out of the med school, they were gone. Yeah, yeah. And once they're gone, it's it's, it's darn hard to get them to come back. So, you know, it's I find um, medicine's a unique profession. It's probably the only profession where you perform services, and after you're done performing services, you then negotiate what you're going to get paid. And in this market, we're getting paid less than almost every other market in the United States, which is the reimbursement level. Um what causes that? And let's touch on Medicaid because it seems like it's a dual thing. We expanded Medicaid services in Nevada, and I think it was Las Vegas Hills that drove that charge of Medicaid expansion. We now have it. Uh, but if we're not making the money back, if we're not being reimbursed, how do we address that? George, you represent one of the largest hospital systems in the state. Can you talk just a little bit about the numbers of reimbursements and Medicaid and just the numbers that you share are just astonishing. And if you could help our audience understand the the magnitude of that problem, I think it'd be an eye opener for all of us. Well, we got the first Medicaid increase legislatively. It was only 5% since uh, in 15 years last session. Wow. And uh, it was only 5%. Uh, Going into last session, hospitals got reimbursed 53% of the cost of treating Medicaid patients. The cost. Yes. The full so cost. they don't even recover what they no. in put into it. That's correct. After oh. the legislation, we're up to 57% of the cost. By next session, it'll be, you know, inflation will eat most of that up. So essentially, uh, the Medicaid patients, you're getting a little over half the cost of treating them. And uh, so like Sunrise Hospital, which we represent, it's a large, 690 beds, largest mm-hmm. hospital in the state. Uh, it also is the uh, seven ICUs, it's the highest acuity hospital in sure. the state. Uh Forty at with Medicaid expansion, forty three percent of their inpatients are now Medicaid. Oh my gosh! And they're getting only fifty seven percent of that cost. So as a businessman, I'm running my numbers, and I don't see black in my P and L. Doug, six and a half percent are also uninsured. There will always be a certain segment of uninsured, particularly for UMC and and Sunrise, because of the fact that people who are undocumented. Uh, and we have the largest proportion of our population in that category of just about any state, uh, they do not get Medicaid, but they do get sick. Sure. And they come to the hospital. So you put those two together, you've got just about 50% of your of your uh, patient body who you're getting just about half of the cost. So you have to make it up somewhere else. You have to make it up somewhere else. And that's why when Senator Reid uh, said when the, during the Affordable Care Act debate that the average Nevada family was – going to save $2,400. It didn't happen for a lot of other aspects of the bill. Mm-hmm. But what he was referring to was something called cost shifting. And the way the hospitals survived for a long time was, and they're still doing this, they have to, is they have to charge the insurance companies and the union health trust and the ERISA plans 
more than they otherwise would to fill that hole. Because somehow, if they, if they don't get that hole, that financial hole filled, uh, they can't survive. So when does my health bill go down because it hasn't? Well, it probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> so so there, there's a big shift there. So Charles, you came out of the post-acute arena. You spent yeah. a large part. Do you all depend on Medicaid as well? Absolutely. Uh, uh, in post-acute, which essentially is uh, uh, facilities like skilled nursing facilities, rehabilitation facilities, and, and the like, anything below the level of acute care hospital, um, we are almost totally dependent on either uh, Medicare or Medicaid. Mm-hmm. It is, it's basically publicly financed. Sure. It is what we're looking at. And, and I think one of the problems here in the state of Nevada, or one of the uniqueness of, of the state of Nevada, is that for, for years and years and years, the, uh, the, the state did not have to invest in, in the infrastructure because they had the gaming industry and the mining industry mm-hmm. that, were, that were basically the, the, the two anchors that were that were supporting so they pay for the everything. state budget the the, uh, the and particularly the gaming industry yeah. when i moved to nevada in 1975 the gaming industry was paying approximately 57 percent of the total uh, state general fund budget wow. i mean that's what their that's what their tax is paid for over time of course that's uh, that's been reduced a little bit but you'd find no other no other area no other state in the country that had you know this concentration of, of of dollars going into the uh, in, into the infrastructure into the state government into mm-hmm. the state budget, uh, and and as a consequence, we didn't we didn't invest in Nevada. I mean, you you see the number of of uh, privately owned hospitals or corporately owned uh, sure. hospitals, and and uh, other uh, medical uh, facilities. In the state of Nevada, you don't you don't find that anywhere else. Yeah, it's a, it's a unique market that we're a for profit right. driven town. That's exactly right, and and we are for profit because I believe that the state did not recognize and and hasn't recognized yet fully what their obligation is in in terms of helping to build that infrastructure and helping to uh, provide those services. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think that. You know, we're, we're changing. Uh, change comes slowly uh, most of, of the does. time. <laughs> but I think things are changing, and, and you know, we're, we're, we're looking at things differently now than we used to. So we've got a lot on the upcoming session. It sounds like reimbursements is going to be a gigantic part of that conversation. And it sounds like we probably need to think about inviting the two of you back to join the show uh, in the future to talk a little bit about reimbursements. I know Las Vegas Hills is tackling that issue and it is top of its priority list. Uh, but unfortunately our show is coming to an end. So, uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll have to pick that up on, on a future episode. But for those of you that uh, have joined us today, thank you for being with us on Inside Medicine. And hopefully you picked up a little bit of information and learned a little bit about the legislative process and some of what Las Vegas Hills has been involved in. Uh, we'll be back here in the studio next Friday at 10 o'clock. Uh, next Friday, we're going to have a unique set of guests. We've got uh, Dr. Stowe Shoemaker, who is the dean of the hotel school over at UNLV, and Cheryl Smith, who is the health and wellness tourism manager from the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority. And they're going to tell us a little bit about a recent report that they're releasing on uh, this Thursday, which is called the Two-Year Accomplishments Report to the Las Vegas Regional Strategic Plan for Health and Wellness Travel. So join us next uh, Friday at 10 o'clock a.m. You can catch us right here on vegasvideonetwork.com slash live. You could also watch uh, the show afterwards on LasVegasHills.org, Facebook, YouTube, Dig. There's a whole slew of places uh, that you're able to watch it, and we encourage you to join us. And thank you for being here today, George and uh, Charles. Thank you both for being in the, the studio today, and we look forward to seeing everybody next week. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug.